there's a lot of challenges. We're talking about like one, two percent of fuel savings. So, hello Tobias. Thank you um, for being open to be interviewed today and uh, yeah, that you maybe share a little bit of your private and especially your work here at the Forjet. Um, give the audience a chance to uh, get to know you a little bit. Maybe you can just introduce who you are, what shoe size you have, I don't know. Shoe size. Yeah, let's start first, <laughs> first things first. Um, yeah, um, hi Kai, thank you for, for being here. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for being the, the chairman here in the session. Um, yeah, my name is Tobias, Tobias Dück. Um, my shoe size is about 45, 44 to 45. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, a uh, middle-aged uh, uh, person. Um, I'm originally born in Munich, um, mm -hmm. uh, lived in Munich for a while, studied in Freiburg. Um, physics and then came to Aachen um, because of my my passion for music actually um, I started, okay. uh, started, started uh, studying physics without really knowing what I wanted to do with it but uh, music was a big passion and here in Aachen I could do acoustics from in, yeah. in, in, in my studies so uh, I ended up here in Aachen and uh, finished my finished my studies here and uh, and then already uh, started uh, well not not right away but yeah sh shortly after already started working here at Forjet um, did my PhD thesis um, part-time at uh, research center in Jülich mm -hmm. and uh, RWTH Aachen University and and Forjet and yeah so that was about 10, 10, 10 and a half years ago yeah um, what uh, what was the first contact uh, situation where you had contact with Forjet why, why did you know the company Actually, that was from applying for a PhD. Uh, there was three. I remember I was looking for a PhD uh, thesis, and there was three offered me from from uh, Forschungszentrum Mülich. They offered three yeah. three types uh, for different topics, and one was already fixed that it was going to be with, in collaboration with Forjet, uh, being like a public funded project, uh, collaboration of the research center and industry, yeah. and that kind of intrigued me most um, just because you already have some PhD can be really academic in a way and, and this way was you, you get to know the, the real life right away yeah um, so that's that was my my first, yeah, uh, so first contact means, back then yeah, yeah you worked for Forjet without directly being an employee for Forjet um, yeah so and then the decision to to start working here was it hard or was it just Course. Did it just happen? <laughs> yeah, 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 I like that. Um, no, I mean, I was, of course, like I, I, I knew a little bit about the company. I mean, I was half time here, half time in, in Jülich. Um, but I, I, I had a feeling for the company, for the people here. So I already had a good impression. Um, and also, um, I, the idea a little bit was also to, so what I did in my PhD to kind of keep doing that in okay. a way. Um, yeah. So, so it was interesting to, to just stay and I was offered a job so I, I took over afterwards and then uh, from, from then on I was 100% budget employee. So uh, what, what, was, what were your first tasks here? How was your development in the last years uh, in, in the project, your role? Um, yeah, uh, um, changing. I mean I started in the lab, um, started in the laser lab, really adjusting mirrors, doing treatments on, on materials, yeah. um, trying out different things, setting up optical setups. Um, so like a, like a process engineer, I think was the, or application engineer, I don't even yeah. know the, 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 the correct job title. Yeah, but then I, I, uh, um, I went into project management a little bit. So there was more complex projects coming in, customers wanting to do like feasibility studies mm -hmm. to see if something completely new is doable. Yeah. Um, so I worked as a project manager for those for a while and uh, it kind of turned out that all these kind of new topics kept landing on my desk um, so so by now um, that it became my job really so by now okay. I have a I have a small uh, a small team or a small department called the new business department which is focused and especially on on like on the new on the new stuff on the new and hot 
stuff, new, new business fields really. Okay, your team is called New Business and you said you focus on something. That means uh, a new, new business, I expect that you have a look on really much different um, possibilities, chances, new processes. Um, but you focus on a project that m means at the moment you are working on one special project and not on several ones, right? And I, 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 I agree with you definitely like new business sounds like like very broad and, and, and it is in a way but on the other hand if you do something new really complex which has never been done before you need a lot of effort and you need a lot of power really to to, to focus so, so you need to focus so there you know if you if you look at like all different things you can't really concentrate on one so right now we're actually doing one main big thing I mean we're already also looking further in the future a little bit but mm -hmm. but now we're, we're, we're working on one topic which has been around for four or five years and, and there's just don't been like little research or uh, uh, yeah research going on or development going on uh, but now we're fully fully into that um, and that is that is um, I mean you probably the next question is probably going to be what is it <laughs> or uh, uh, it's a question after but you can talk <laughs> <laughs> no go ahead well then to put another question in between yeah I'm interested in your team you said uh, we are working we are working so oh, yeah. I expect everyone is a laser technician in your team and uh, competences are quite the same actually no <laughs> yeah. um, so um, the team is um, it's Five to six people. Um, you know, we're still still flexible. Still looking for for a new uh, job anyway. <laughs> for, for <laughs> vacancies open, uh, um, and uh, well, we're it's an in interdisciplinary team. So there is there's okay. people from all different kinds. There is definitely laser guys, laser lab guys, but there's also project managers like um, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. So the idea really is to have like a like a flexible task force that is that can handle like that works Every really topic, closely yeah. intermingled so really like I, I looked up the other way the difference between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and I'm okay still not is there a difference? <laughs> I think interdisciplinary is when there's a like one um, one person has different roles so like one person ah, okay. is an engineer but also does programming yeah. And multidisciplinary is just you have a team of an engineer, of a programmer, okay, of um, so, and it's kind of both in, in that way. So we have different backgrounds, but we're working really closely together. So we're meeting like two or three times a, a week, every like for morning rise. It's kind of a little bit like a scrum agile work yeah, okay, work okay. progress. Um, so the idea is really to have a small, fast boat that can maneuver quickly and and can do a lot of. And everybody kind of does everything anyway, so everybody has their like specialty. But but yeah. then if something needs to get done, you know, somebody will do it, and, and yeah, you know, okay. just get the job Very done. That's, yeah, nice. that's that's it really about. So now I know how you work. On what are you working? I know. I know. <laughs> no, no, the next question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, what we're working on is a uh, like exciting project. I I, I personally think um, it's uh, we are actually trying to um, mimic. A shark skin with yeah. lasers. So, like we we modify a surface, so um, it, it it is like a shark skin, which reduces. How, drag. how does a shark skin look like? Can you explain? Um, gray. <laughs> 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 well, but but that's not the point. Um, really, the important bit is that a shark on the scales of a shark, um, there is like small groves or small like. Um, ribs, you call them riblets. Um, okay. That's that's kind of the the the, the name that was uh, that's being used in the in the in the uh, in the field. Yes. Um, so what it is really is like small, a couple hundred micrometer thin. Um, you could think of it like as a it's like a like a shape like this. Okay. Like, like you have. It's um, crazy. I thought shark is looks very. Um, Smooth, smooth, yeah. Yeah, but you, yeah, it should touch one. They really, if you touch it, it's like sandpaper. It's really, it's yeah. not smooth at all. Um, and these these riblets or these kind of uh, yeah, groves in the in the in the skin, um, the shark has it to um, to be able to swim faster or more efficient. Let's put it this way. 
So yeah. it's a fairly so complex mechanism, actually. So they, um, and I'm not, I'm not aerodynamic um, guy, so I yeah. can't, can't really explain into too much detail, but um, the, the general idea really is that um, there are, like if the, if the, if the, if the, um, the main flow kind of goes along this direction, mm -hmm. um, these are, the riblets are like this. Okay. And when it, whenever there's a flow in this direction, there's also vortices that appear, you know, yeah. in this direction, like perpendicular the turning, to, yeah. to but, but the flow is in this direction, so the shark's swimming this way, yeah. uh, but the water is also spinning like this. And this kind of spinning vortices, or these eddies, they, they have a friction on the surface that is not really wanted, or like, you know, that they, they, they yeah. induce friction. Yes. And the way I, I oops, the way I uh, really uh, picture it, and I don't know if it's 100% correctly in a, in a, for, for, for an aerodynamic point of view, is that when you have these, these riblets, these vortices only, you know, they only have friction on the top of the tips of those riblets. So they don't go in the, in the, in the valleys yes. anymore. So they, and, and then you can uh, reduce the, 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 the kind of friction you don't want. Yeah, 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 I see. Um, and you can save up to, like, there's about up to 10% uh, drag reduction by just structuring the surface in a way. So, and this has been around actually for quite a while already. So they, they, they actually first, uh, um, in the 50s, they, they found that on the shark skin, but they, or the, like these riblets, but they didn't know what it was for. Ah, okay. Um, and it took them about 10 or 20 years. I think NASA then finally found out that the sharks has it because of the drag reduction. And then a lot of, uh, it, it, it was kind of hyped in the 80s, 90s, and there were already planes, some single planes flying with riblets. And then there was, I don't know, we might remember um, swimmers at the Olympic Games oh, yeah, had long suits, suits all of a sudden. Right. Um, also because they were actually more efficient swimming than being completely smooth surfaces or, 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 yeah. or you know, small speedos. Um, yeah, but, but then it kind of died out because it didn't really, there was not a really a good way to apply it, for example, on a plane. Um, so the kind of, uh, 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 the hype a little bit vanished, but it's, but it's coming up again now. Okay, so that's the reason why you try it or do it now with laser. So the idea is 40 years old, 50 years old, but up to now no one solved it in an industrial way. Exactly. Yeah, and okay, that's interesting. Until now. <laughs> now yeah. there's a small Gallic village now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, now we are, we're tackling the topic and we think we have found a, a good way how we can how we can uh, produce this and actually have it stable processing on large areas. That's, that's mainly the big thing. You can do it on small areas, yeah. but, but one of the key challenges is, for example, on planes, you have to think the plane is huge. Oh, yeah, large areas. And, yeah. you have to, and the plane can't really take long. It, it's expensive when it just sits in a hangar somewhere. So, yeah. um, so, and your plan is to structure the plane directly, the surface of the plane. Exactly. Yeah, so, okay. actually, the paint of the plane. So the, the mm -hmm. all the aircrafts are painted with certain coats that protect them from the environment. I mean, yeah. you can imagine a plane is uh, landing in Dubai at 50 degrees C and a sandstorm. Yeah. And then within, or it starts there, and within half an hour, it is up at I don't know how many kilometers. Uh, yeah. Kilometers, where it's minus 50 degrees C. So the the paint is really um, important to, to keep the structure together. So the idea really is with a special laser treatment to, to make those groves, make those riblets, engrave them in the dry paint yeah. of the aircraft. Can you maybe explain um, more details about this laser process? I will try to find out where are the limits. Now you are working on paint, what other materials are possible, yeah. something like that. Yeah, actually, I prepared a slide um, to because this is um, like I mentioned earlier. It's not a normal laser process; it's a special laser process. So, in order to understand that better, I, can, I have a slide here where you can um, where you can see the difference. So, if you think of a of a, a, a normal laser process, you you know the, you can see here the laser beam on the left. Yeah. 
um, and a workpiece on the bottom. And if you think about like what normal laser processes are like, all the, all the, uh, uh, well, you can see the laser intensity. Um, if you so, this would be like if you put a camera under the laser beam. But all the magic behind most of the laser process really is you you use the laser beam, you put it on a workpiece, and you and you blow a hole in it. So it's really just like you heat up the material, yeah. the material evaporates, and you have a hole in it. So so this is all the the magic fa fancy laser <laughs> processing. I mean, of course, it's more it's more difficult in detail, but but that's the general principle. Yeah, it's easy to understand. <laughs> and way. and this is because of the electromagnetic electromagnetic field actually, because that is shown a little bit on the left in the black and white lines in the yeah. laser beam, that is the oscillating electromagnetic field. And what that does is that it actually heats the electrons in the material mm -hmm. um, and they start to oscillate yes. and that is heat. And that, so, so that makes it hot and that makes it evaporate, right? So what we do now, so this is classical, but what we do now is this. Um, it's called laser interference processing. So we take a laser beam and split it up into two Mm -hmm. and bring it together again at the surface, which is a little bit more complicated, or you probably ask, well, why are you doing that? Yeah. Um, and the reason really, you can quite simply see in this, in this picture already, I took just the graph on the left and I, and I overlaid it, and you can see those black lines appearing uh, um, yeah. in, the, in the overlapping area. And, and this is just like, you, you, know, you might know it as like a Moret effect or something for in, in graphics, but it's really like that, in this area, the electromagnetic field is not present anymore. It's not oscillating anymore. Mm -hmm. So if it's not oscillating, there's no laser intensity, there's no heat. So if you have two beams like this and you put a camera in the overlapping area, you can see a spot like this. So this is actually a camera yeah, image. Already looks like ripplets. Is, is that already the result? How, uh, Almost. <laughs> yeah, okay. But that's, that's the key point, really. I mean, that you that you have when you put the surface in there, then you have within one laser spot, you yeah. have a substructure. You don't use the, the spot itself or the laser itself as the smallest feature you write, oh, but yeah. you use the substructure in within the laser beam that, that, uh, that uh, happens how, to... How uh, tiny are the structures that you can, can make with this? Um, depending on the, depends on the angle actually of the beams mm -hmm. and also on the, um, uh, on the wavelength. Of, so there's, so there's yeah, a sure. simple formula, but from a couple hundred nanometers all the way to a couple hundred micrometers, so it's, it's scalable. Um, but I have another picture where you can see it a little better here, what one laser spot actually looks like with these yeah. lines in between. And what is important is like the, here the, uh, uh, the, uh, the header already says it, why, why are we doing this is that if you, if you now look at example writing riblets, um, if you look at a, a classical laser writing, you would have to focus the beam yeah. to, to write like a, here's about a hundred micron deep grove or a deep riblet. Um, so you can, first of all, you can only write one at a time. Yeah. Um, and second, even maybe even more or equally important is that um, with, when you focus that small, you only have a small depth of field. Mm -hmm. It's just basic physics, numerical ap aperture. You just, yeah. when you smoke, like you might know it from a microscope, when you look in a microscope, you only have a, the higher the magnification, the lower is the, the res or the, the lower is the depth of field you have. Yeah. Right. Same thing here. Um, so, meaning you have to be really accurate in positioning the sample to the, to the laser. Yes. So with the interference patterning now, we don't need to focus the beam anymore. We can leave the beam as it is, and we can just use the substructure of the beam yeah. to, uh, to make those riblets. So while we, at the one hand, can write 1,000 riblets at a time, on the other hand, we have a lot larger depth of field. So like here on the left, we would have to, we'd have to focus like on 100 micrometer exact. On yeah. the right, we have like plus minus a centimeter depth of field. And that is important if we're thinking about, for example, air air airplanes. really effective compared to the other focusing method, yeah. And more forgiving like if you make a mistake or if if, if the plane moves while you tr yeah. while you while you're treating it you can you know you have a depth of field that doesn't just you know the process doesn't stop yeah. or, 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 or break something and you also mentioned you are using co2 laser correct that's that, co2 laser that already answers my feeling for material you can 
work on nearly everything, right? True. Like this is uh, CO two laser is absorbed in most like organic uh, materials, um, but even like glass or wood or you know like uh, yeah. all different kinds of paint systems, all kind of plastics um, uh, can can be treated. So this is this is also another. Um, could be another, but could be the next application for this to, to, to take this further for, for some, uh, um, apart from like the drag redu reducing bit to some, uh, to, to some haptic device or some, yeah. some light, uh, like, a opa like making it um, like diffusing light diffuser kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the key really is that we have the high speed, like talking about about square meter per minute. Uh, rates are so really, really high speed um, for, for uncovering large areas with not needing too much accuracy. So that enables us to do it, for in this, in this example, to, to actually work on a full plane. Like on yeah. A fully assembled plane. A fully assembled plane. So that is really the target, not to clean the parts. You build a small machine, maybe handheld, I don't know, it's possible, and, and make the small parts, you need to go to an aircraft and somehow build a machine to bring it on. Oh, that sounds really challenging. The simple reason is just most of the aircraft are painted when they're assembled, because the paint is the top layer. And since yeah. we need to go on the paint, we have to do it on the fully assembled aircraft. Yeah. And that means, yeah, huge robots somehow in a hangar in an environment which is not a laser lab uh, where you have perfect control over everything. So this is kind of a, this is a key challenge actually to... to yeah. Is there, um, that sounds already very concrete. You have an idea where you want to go. This technology sounds like you have a wide range of possibilities. Are you already thinking about the next, as, as you say, the next step could be to work on this and that, or who, who's a potential customer? I, I must think about, I don't know, golf ball producers or something like that, everyone, car producers. Are, are they a good customer for you, for your process? Um, the, the golf balls already have the dimples, so the, yeah. the, uh, the cars apparently don't, although in, there is some special uh, cars that use that technology as well. Um, but actually, um, for cars, um, there's one kind of like scientific detail that these these riblets, so the the size of the riblets, mm -hmm. has to be perfectly matched with the flow conditions. So with the Reynolds number of the surrounding flow okay. uh, uh, environment, um, and that changes whenever, for example, the speed changes, when the when the size of the object changes, when the density of the fluid changes. Um, so meaning, if that doesn't match, the, the riblet size doesn't match the, the, the environment of the flow, these riblets can actually not only not work, but could also have a negative effect. So that again means you have to optimize these, the riblet size for one steady state condition in a way. So meaning a car, like yeah. a normal traffic car, you know, like you stop, you, stop you go, you, you, uh. you, know, you don't have a steady state while, for example, on an aircraft, Especially long haul aircraft, uh, you have a cruise, cruise uh, uh, okay, speed so and, and cruise conditions. Okay, so it makes only sense for special applications. Yeah, yeah, in, in, in a way. But there is definitely more 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 things we think of. Um, we're focusing on the on the uh, aircraft right now. Yeah. Um, but but there's definitely more uh, that that we can that we can tackle, and we have that in the back of our minds. And uh, yeah, um, that that'll be the future. <laughs> I know you are not allowed or not willing to share too much information about this project because it's a yeah, brand new thing. Um, I already understood that it's a big challenge to bring it somehow on a big airplane to build a machine like this or I don't know how to handle. Um, is that really the biggest point in the project or I don't know, maybe you have a funny situation or interesting situation in the project. Biggest challenge? Definitely, ch ch there's a lot of challenges. Let's put a it lot this of way. challenges, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the putting this on the, uh, the, the actual robot or whatever, or manipulator that will kind of, you know, the idea is that we have something 
that will guide our laser beam over the over the fully assembled plane is a, is a big thing especially because automation is not really in the uh, for example in painting of aircraft automation is not really used a lot yet not okay. like in an in automotive industry um, but but also another really big thing is going to be certification of the whole process you can think of um, aviation industry really a lot of safety related uh, related issues oh, you know, sure um, you you can't just change something on a plane and say okay it'll you know it'll it'll go <laughs> you know so so you have to be like there's a there's a strong uh, 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 a process of certification until you are actually allowed to fly something like this yeah. so this is definitely another key challenge which is not so much on the on the technology side um, but but more on the uh, yeah, pa pa paperwork side, let's put it this way. I mean, of course, it is technology related as well. Like, we have to make sure that the aerodynamic is not changed in a bad way. Yeah, right? cool. Um, so, so this is another, uh, this is another, another big thing, right? Apart from the pure, pure uh, technical yeah. uh, challenge, really. Okay, then, thank you for the, the insights in your project and, and your work. Um, I uh, now aim for um, what you think will happen in the next 10 years or 20 years. Sounds like a game changer for this one small topic. How do you see it in the world in 20 years? Good that you say it's a small topic. Uh, if, you, if you think uh, how many planes are out there and like maybe this is something I didn't mention, but, but in the end we're talking about like a like couple, like one, two percent of fuel savings. Yeah, and and if you if I mean it sounds sounds yeah, small, it's not much, yeah. but but if you if you multiply that by the number of of uh, uh, um, airplanes or about fuel consumption, and maybe this is another thing I have to uh, make a little bit more talk a little bit more about the project. But this is a great thing about the project that you or with these with these riblets, you can save fuel, and at the same time you reduce CO2 emissions. Emissions. So, yeah. so with every you know barrel of, of, of kerosene you don't, which you don't blow up in the air, you have less uh, CO2 emissions. So it's actually a good way to to save save the world, and also save money doing it. So that that'll be yeah, nice. like a good uh, for for people. Also, you asked about customers earlier, for people to adapt because they have they have two um, two reasons really. Not only normally things that are good for your environment cost money. Here it's the opposite. But so coming back to your questions in 10, 15 years, I mean, I hope that uh, in 10, 15 years, there's the first uh, uh, planes with laser riblets flying. Uh, but also, yeah, definitely there's other um, applications. You know, you can think of ships, um, ship hulls. Uh, they also the same. I mean, the shark is in the water. So uh, and also I'm thinking, are you limited to this riblet structure? So I can imagine if I don't know. Yeah, you, you can you can make homogeneous structures on big surfaces. It must not be for aerodynamic behavior, right? Exactly. That's yeah. that can be for. So if someone needs a structured big area solution, he can call you and you try yeah, your best. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like I said, the the key, the key parameters really are like order of magnitude square meters per minute. Um, and and like structures that are you know that can, can be for touch that can be for to, to stick yeah. better that can be for optical appearances. Um, yeah. There's another question coming in my mind. We are at the moment talking about CO2 lasers because we are working with it, but I know there is a limitation. You cannot um, work with metal then. So will that be maybe a future view? to work on, on metal surfaces with different laser sources, or is this a bad idea to, to use another wavelength? No, I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, there, is, there is definitely, uh, you, you, with the wavelength, you also change the scale of the features. Sure. Um, like I said earlier, because if we're talking about the interference patterning uh, uh, part still, um, definitely, there's ways you can do hydrophobic surfaces, which you know need smaller features, you know, or or, or like perfect pitch black surfaces. Um, the thing is, really, there's a there's a huge amount of applications you can think of, and yeah. and that then that's where actually we're kind of we're coming back to the beginning. You have to really you know pick one that is kind of promising because you can't do everything yeah. uh, because it's all new development. 
uh, and 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 it's not really possible to do like ten at the same time. Um, so bit by bit, but yeah, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of possibilities. Thank you. We are yeah. at the end of uh, my questions. Do you have something else to add, maybe? No, then I just have my typical question I asked everyone up to now. Um, when I give you the topic 4Jet, which are the five buzzwords coming in your mind directly? Five buzzwords? Yeah, it's a lot, I know. Well, I mean, the, the, the obvious ones uh, that kind of, you know, like, Laser, laser <laughs> high-tech, uh, innovation, you know, these are probably the most uh, uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of obvious ones. But also, like, I think, um, I mean, more maybe related to working on, on at 4Jet, so like yeah. more like an internal view. Um, I, I really like working at 4Jet. Uh, it, it is a, it's a really kind of a more like a, like a human human surrounding, maybe. Like mm -hmm. so, it's like Forget is is maybe a little bit human, so you don't feel like you're in a machine. So maybe human could be okay. one. Or, I mean, family sounds a little cheesy, but but yeah, uh, but, but it's mean. like you know, it's not it's not the big factory that you just go in and do your job. It's kind of it's more than that. It has a purpose in a way. So yeah. purpose could be another one. Um, okay. And can be a little bit chaotic at times. So 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 yeah, like a. Like a friendly chaos, Some, sometimes also that, so. Yeah, nice. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. roughly, these are the, the buzzwords, I'd say. Nice, thank you. You're welcome, it was a pleasure.